very, uh, very warm introduction. If my late mother were here, uh, she would believe every word of it. But if was my late father were here, he would, uh, being a realist, wonder who you were talking about. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm grateful to all those people who have helped in one way or another, and they know who they are. Uh, I'd like to thank Mark for arranging for the venue here at the, uh, at the university, which is uh, very helpful. And uh, I guess, uh, apart from the, uh, does our former premier wish to be acknowledged? Uh, where are you, Ed? Say hello to Ed Schreier over here for uh, turning up. Uh, man after my own heart. <clears throat> the only other uh, claim to fame I have is that um, you're a distinguished former uh, president of this university. The Honorable Lloyd Axworthy uh, once worked with me as my executive assistant housing in my early days in politics. And so I have that much uh, in common with the university too and with this area and uh, a long-standing uh, association with Winnipeg and its, uh, and its people. So the subject of my address is uh, a plan to make Canada really po prosperous again, but might just as easily have been an orange alert or a red alert now, a uh, reseda, the Canada-Europe trade agreement which Prime Minister Trudeau hopes to sign next week. In which case, if it were ratified, it would be game over for Canada. And any hope of really being prosperous again would go out the window. So that's where we are tonight, and we're right on the cusp. In fact, it could be either one or both titles because they are primarily about money. What it is and its power. And why there never seems to be enough of it to, pri to provide jobs for the unemployed and to meet the many legitimate needs of government at all levels to build new infrastructure as well as maintaining and renewing that which already exists. Well, it's impossible to understand the magnitude and importance of the subject without putting it in context of the real world. How did we get into this mess? And who is responsible? Who is calling the shots? As early as October 1940, The Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, D.C. wrote a memo assuming that Hitler would lose the war and saying that they should start working on a new empire which would take in all of the land that presumably Hitler had his eyes on, plus all of North America, plus uh, many Southeast Asian countries as well. <coughs> and um, the truth is they've been working at it ever since. When the war ended, there was an operation called Operation Paperclip. I don't know how many of you have, have heard of it. Well, you're a very informed audience. And um, as you know, the U.S. military was interested in getting uh, its hands on a number of uh, scientists, Nazi scientists, before they were uh, taken over by somebody else, by the Russians or the Chinese or, or whoever. And um, so they, they got a, their hands on a list that they wanted, and they went after them. They got President Truman to give them the okay but on the basis that there were no members of that group that had had close Nazi associations. 
Unfortunately, the, the military, I understand very well from personal experience, ignored the president's order and just uh, took anybody they wanted. And it included uh, a number of people who had been very active in the Nazi party. And they were given new identities and brought into the United States and given new jobs with new CVs and some in the military and some in intelligence and some in civil life. And one of the interesting dichotomies was that here was the CIA, good old CIA meddling. They had one arm that was <coughs> out looking for Nazis who had managed to get into the country illegally. And on the other hand, they were bringing them in under their own auspices and setting up identities for them so that they could have all the privileges and perks of American citizens. Well, presumably this was to help fight communists, <coughs> but that was the beginning of what President Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex that he warned us to beware of. It is a now an integral part of the power elite. The one-tenth of the top one percent that I and many others have called the cabal. It comprises, first of all, the Council on Foreign Relations that began the Big Empire Project in the 1940s. Then the very secretive group called the Bilderbergers, which uh, was organized post-war and with some uh, good ideas, but eventually it became not only one of the most secretive, but one of the most powerful organizations in the whole world. And later, the less secretive um, Trilateral Commission joined the uh, group uh, after Zygmunt Brzezinski got the idea of Japan was coming up, thought they should be included. So he and uh, David Rockefeller took the idea to the Bilderberg meeting and it was approved and so the Trilateral Commission was born. And you have three organizations with a lot of cross-membership and I call them, in my books, the Three Sisters. You could also call them the Power Elite, a.k.a. the Cabal. And the cabal comprises not only the three sisters, but also the banking cartel, which is at its apex. It's the very top of the power structure. And then below that is the oil cartel. And just below that are the big transnational corporations, most of which are controlled directly or indirectly by the banking cartel. And then there are certain parts of intelligence organizations, the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, our big brother who's keeping track of us all, so we don't need to worry. They know where we are. And uh, other organizations, including the British MI6 and the Israeli Mossad. And huge critically important slice of the U.S. military. And not only are they called the cabal, they are called in the United States the shadow government. And they have been running the United States since Eisenhower and running much of the Western world and more. This shadow government is so all-inclusive his power is recognized by insiders. And when Sarah McClendon, a well-established member of the press corps at the White House, asked President Clinton why he didn't uh, disclose more of the information about uh, UFOs and the extraterrestrials, his reply, and I quote it verbatim, 
with Sarah. There is a government within the government, and I don't control it. Imagine the President of the United States, the most powerful country in the world, the man with his finger allegedly on the atomic button, and he doesn't know and isn't told what his troops are doing. And so when the scientists who had come to the United States and others who had gotten together moved their operation to Nevada, to Area 51, they were not willing to tell the president what they were doing. So he threatened to send in the first army from Colorado. And then they allowed him to send four CIA members that were friends of his that he could rely on to see what was going on. Of course, all they found out was exactly what they expected, and that was that they were back engineering one of the craft that had crashed at Roswell in 1947. There has not been a president since that has been told all of the things that are going on. And uh, it's, it's difficult to believe, but that is the truth. So no president, no Congress. Congress has had practically no knowledge whatsoever of what's been going on, even though they have um, authorized, by one means or another, hundreds of billions of dollars, yes, in fact, trillions of dollars, for what they call black operations, including the back engineering <coughs> of extraterrestrial vehicles. <coughs> so what the cabal is all inclusive is in support of a new world order comprising a dictatorship controlled by them. The apex of their power is the money mafia, which has been robbing ordinary folks for centuries. The money mafia or cartel has a monopoly on the creation of money. Consequently, as money is the gasoline that drives economic engines, the cartel controls the levels of un unemployment and rates of growth in most countries in the world, including, I'm sorry to say, our own. And there is no hope for the kind of robust growth that we had in the early post-war years as long as they have a monopoly. No hope. Because we're in a position where any government, it doesn't matter what stripe it is, needs money to do essential things. And there's only two ways to get it. That's taxation or borrowing. And some of us think taxes are just about high enough already. And secondly, we've got a huge national debt, federal, $615 billion. And that's just federal. It doesn't include the provinces and the municipalities. And uh, and there are a lot of people who think that we don't want to go further in debt because there's no way to pay it off. As long as the cartel has a monopoly, they create all the money as debt. And it's debt that has to be repaid, principal and interest, but nobody creates any money with which to pay either the principal or interest. So there's only one way to keep going, and that's to borrow more and keep going deeper and deeper into debt. <laughs> so there's no hope for the kind of robust growth that we saw in the early post-war years, and that I was so familiar with my earlier years, than a huge infusion of government-created debt-free money.
and it's going to take a lot of it because the debt levels to, in the world today are the highest they have ever been. There's more debt than there's ever been before. And so we're drowning in an ocean of debt and we have to dilute it enough to be able to keep going and especially to have robust growth and uh, positive economies. Well, to understand what I'm talking about, a little history of what money is and where it comes from can help. I had the lunch with Mark Olson today and he tried out on one of the waitresses to find out what she knew about money. And it's, she knew a little more about it than some people, but not very much. And uh, she knew that it was printed, but so, of course what she didn't know is that most of it isn't printed. And uh, of our money supply today, I'm sure this audience would be pretty well aware of this, only 3%, roughly, is legal tender. Less than 1% of coins, less than 3% of paper, printed money that you always see in the newsreels. The other 97%, <coughs> are bank accounts, bank entries. And they're not real money. They're not legal tender. They're just computer entries. That's all they are. But let's go back about three centuries. In 1640, Charles I confiscated all of the money in the mint at the Tower of London, stole from his people, Mr. Nice Guy we call him, and uh, so the rich people in London had to look somewhere else for safe places for their money. So they settled on the... Um, the goldsmiths of Lombard Street. And the goldsmiths of Lombard Street were chosen because they had the boxes already that were fireproof and could be used. And so they took deposits of the rich people's money in London and uh, they gave certificates of receipts, really, for the money that was deposited and uh, paid interest on the receipts on the understanding they could lend the money to their rich friends when it wasn't being used, <coughs> which they did. But it didn't take them long to find out that they could lend more money than they had gold in their boxes because people didn't come in and get it very often. Same thing as we do with cash today. Somebody would buy a fur coat, they wouldn't come in and get a bundle of gold and carry it over their back. They would just take certificates. A lot easier. And so what the goldsmiths did was a scam and it was illegal, but they got away with it because it was legitimized when the Bank of England was chartered in July 27, 1694. The rich people of, um, well, first of all, King William had been uh, waging war in France, and he'd run out of money. His uh, armaments were shambles. He had to renew the armaments and build a new navy, and his credit was no good, so he uh, couldn't borrow money. Somebody said, well, why don't you set up a bank, which he did, got Parliament to approve it. The rich people in London subscribed 1.1 million 200,000 uh, pounds in gold and silver and lent all of it to the king at 8%, which is a pretty high interest rate for a government-guaranteed loan. 
Then the king said, well, I'm very pleased with you, so I'm going to let you print P-R-I-N-T, an equal number of uh, bills, certificates, saying Bank of Canada, and lend them to your rich friends at high interest rates. So in effect, the bank was able to lend the same money to two different people at the same time, the king and their friends, and collect interest on it twice. Well, that's better than getting interest on once. And that was really the beginning of what was called the partial reserve system of banking, which has been uh, a plague ever since. Well, over the years, the greed of the, and af or avarice of the banks and the collusion of the politicians, that uh, ratio, which was two to one, the, what we call leverage, uh, became much more generous. In the early years of the 20th century in the United States, federally incorporated banks had to have cash reserves, well actually gold reserves, 25 percent. They had to have 25 percent gold to, against their depositors. In Canada, which I well remember, our banks had to have 8 percent cash and that meant they could lend the same money 12, 12 and a half times. Well then, along comes Dr. Friedman and his uh, friends at the University of uh, Chicago, and uh, they put in a plug for monetarism and deregulation, and that resulted in the banks being able to lend the same money 20 times. Some of them a lot more than that, but 20 times is sort of the norm. And in my opinion, that's grand larceny. You know, for a long while I've kept a file on the mafia, or mafia, if you prefer, and you'll recall that there was a, uh, an investigation in Montreal not too long ago where it was alleged that the, um, the mafia had been, Sicilian mafia, mafia had been taking a two, two and a half percent off the top of all of the construction contracts in the city for years. The money mafia takes 95 percent off the top. So I guess if 2.5% is a good thing, 95% is better. They can invest $5 million in what I call blood, sweat, and tears money. That's the kind of money you go out and earn. Working, cutting down trees, uh, giving haircuts, uh, working in a shop, working in a factory blood, sweat, and tears, because you've earned the money. But they only have to put up five million of that to make loans equal to a hundred million. And the hundred million has to be repaid in blood, sweat, and tears money plus interest. And I don't think it's fair, for example, uh, this wasn't a problem in my day, but it has been recently, that they can loan students $50,000 to finish their studies, and all of the blood, sweat, and tears money that they invest to do that is 2500 But the students have to repay 50000 in blood, sweat, and tears plus interest. And that's the way the system works. Well, the way the banks create money is this way. 
If you need $35,000 for a car, you go in, see your bank manager, and ask for a loan. And they'll say, well, what collateral have you got? Any stocks or bonds, if you haven't got that? Second mortgage on your, on your cottage, or third mortgage on your house? And if you haven't got that, maybe a rich friend or relative that will co-sign. And when they're satisfied with the, uh, with the collateral, they'll ask you to sign a note for the $35,000 principal, repayable on demand, plus interest at some prime plus some rate. It used to be quite higher than it is now, but let's say uh, 3 or 4% or 5%, depending on the color of your eyes. And uh, the way they make their money is by what they call a spread. If you decide, oh, I left something out here. Once you have signed the note, then they go over and tap their computers, and presto, $35,000 appears in your account, which you can go out and spend to buy a car. Seconds earlier, that money did not exist. And it's the biggest myth in banking that when you go in to borrow money, you're borrowing the money that I or somebody else deposited the day before. Not so. They are nearly always fully lent. And when you go in to borrow money and they give you a loan, they manufacture it out of thin air. But then you have to repay it with blood, sweat, and tears. And the way they, as they say, the way they make their money is because if you decided not to uh, buy the car right away because you thought you were going to get a better one, uh, the new model's coming out and you leave the money there for a while, they'll pay either zero interest or maybe an eighth of one percent while they're charging you three, four, or five on your note. And the difference between these two is the way they make their money. So the more loans they create, the more mortgages they create, the more money they make. And uh, the present system is insane. And you don't need a PhD in economics to understand this. Anybody with grade 8 or 10 or 12 mathematics should know that the system is unstable and unsustainable. I wasn't just kidding when I said the rich elite have been robbing the rest of us for centuries. Sometime this year, 1% of the world's population will own as much as the world's, of the world's wealth as all the other 99%. Can you imagine? Two years ago, 88, 88 families own 50% of the world's wealth. Last year was 80 families. This year, it is 62 families. And it's getting smaller and more concentrated all the time. And I can't, get my, I can't really get my mind around this. Because I stopped to think about it, and what we're really saying is that you start taking all the big cities of the world, Peking, Beijing, Tokyo, San Francisco, Vancouver, Winnipeg, Toronto, Montreal, New York, across the pond, London, Manchester, uh, Paris, Bonn, on and on around the whole world, and every second one of those cities, they own lock, stock, and borrow. I don't know. This, it's, it's, it's almost beyond my comprehension, and yet that is a statistic. And it's getting worse every year. And this concentration of wealth is due to globalization. 
trade treaties that transfer power from the people to the elite, and a private monopoly on money creation. And these two things are leading to disaster. World debt is at an all-time high and getting higher all the time. While a study for the Davos, or Davos if you prefer, forum, estimated that world unemployment could soar to, listen to this, 250 million people this year. But it doesn't need to be that way. And that's the good news. We, the banks don't own the right to create money. We, the people, do. Banks are just licensees subject to rules set by politicians. And it's the rules that are really faulty. It's a boom-bust system that allowed Wall Street and the City of London to precipitate the crash of 1929, leading to the Great Depression of the 1930s. It was the rules that allowed Wall Street to crash the system again in 2007, 2008, and create the Great Recession that has affected millions of people worldwide and is responsible largely for the fact that we have a million young Canadians unemployed on average ever since that time. And it's a longer time now than the Great Depression. And it's going on and on. It will last as long as the present rules and the banks rule the world. In a new book entitled The Great Divide, Unequal Societies and What We Can Do About Them, Nobel Laureate Joseph Stiglitz says that the only hope to save capitalism for the 99% of the people is a change in the balance of power. Warren Buffett, one of the world's richest men, recently said there is a war between the rich and the poor, and we, the rich, are winning, as if we didn't know. Well, that is the key. The Stiglitz proposals are less than convincing, but the principle is dead on. The private monopoly on money creation has to end, period. And the money creation function has to be shared by the people and the banks so that trillions of dollars can be created for governments debt-free to dilute that ocean of debt in which I pointed out we are drowning, while at the same time providing the aggregate demand, which is another term for purchasing power, to resuscitate the world economy and provide hope to the tens of millions of unemployed youth who have lost hope. Well, theoretically, it should be the United States that does something about this mess because they're primarily responsible for it. I, in my opinion, and they should take the initiative to uh, set it right. Unfortunately, the chances of that happening are nil, absolutely nil. A little over a hundred years ago, the U.S. Congress handed over the right to create money to a handful of the richest bankers in the world when the Federal Reserve System was adopted. In my book, The Money Mafia, I call it the biggest heist in history. Just three years after the passage of the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, President Woodrow Wilson realized the magnitude of the mistake and wrote, and I quote, a great industrial nation is controlled by a system of credit, and then added, we have become one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the civilized world. 
Can you imagine politicians being irresponsible enough to hand over the people's right to create money to the world's richest bankers? I won't answer that question. But the bill was not repealed. It's still in operation. After one, more than 100 years, the sellout is still the law. Nor is it likely to be repealed as long as it is legal for financial institutions to contribute to political election expenses. The best that the U.S. can hope for is that someone else will take the lead and show the way. One success would create the political climate for action elsewhere. And here comes the rub. Of all the countries in the G20, Canada is, the best, is in the best position to act. We have all of the essentials necessary to do it and to do it quickly. We own our central bank, the Bank of Canada, outright, 100%. The Minister of Finance has the ultimate control over policy. This was hashed out when they had the, what they called the coin controversy. And finally, a deal was struck that the bank would have day-to-day -day, uh, independence, but the Minister of Finance would have the ultimate control, and all he had to do was put his policy in a letter and send it to the governor, but then he had to publish it in the Canada Gazette so the people would know what was going on, and then they could judge who was right and who was wrong. And then we have a precedent that proved the principle of shared responsibility for money creation. The only thing missing at the present time is the political will to innovate, even when the need is so obvious. And this distresses me because I have seen the system work. There are both advantages and disadvantages to being old. In 1938, there were no jobs in Canada, none. In 1939, the war broke out, and soon everyone was working in the Army, Navy, or Air Force, building uh, factories, making munitions, doing something useful towards the war effort. We re actually reached a a record low of 1% unemployment. And I'm not recommending that now because to meet, reach that would be inflationary, but uh, I think we could reduce what we've got by half and put half of the young people back to work and that would, uh, would provide opportunity and, uh, and hope for everyone. And uh, Then, after the war, well, the, you might say, well, where did, the money, the, where did the government get the money to do that? Well, the Bank of Canada printed it, P-R-I-N-T-E-D, printed it, and turned it over to the government at near zero cost. If anybody's interested in the mechanism, I could tell them how it actually worked. After the war, we kept the same system where the Bank of Canada was providing the government of Canada with very large sums of near zero cost money. And we used it for all of the major infrastructure. St. Lawrence Seaway, Trans-Canada Highway, the dew line, anybody remember what the dew line was? The distant early warning line of the radar stations all around the periphery of the continent. Very expensive and lots of projects, including probably the Gardner and Toronto, which is long overdue to come down, and also to help finance our social security system. And we paid for all of that, including the infrastructure, without borrowing any significant amount of money, and without an inflation rate that was any different than the average in the OECD countries. So we've done it, 
It works. We have a precedent. And we should never have abandoned it. The system worked like a charm from 1939 to 1974 and <clears throat> gave us the best years of the 20th century. Then in 1974, the Bank of Canada Governor Gerald Bowie adopted monetarism. I doubt very much that he knew what he was doing. And it's been downhill ever since. And incidentally, in 1974, we seldom saw anyone sleeping on the streets. There were no food banks in Canada, not one. Now there are 2,065. And the Bank of Canada abandoned its shareholders, our, us, in favor of taking orders from the Bank for International Settlements in Zurich, Switzerland, with its Nazi roots. And they were required to stop lending cheap money to government. Well, they used interest rates to control inflation in accordance with the other central banks, and we had those two terrible recessions. And I remember how awful they were. Thousands of people put off out of their jobs. Thousands of people lost their homes. A lot of people lost their farms and their businesses. And we had to borrow expensive money. Some of you will remember in 1981, 82, um, that uh, interest rates went up as high as 22% in Canada. And if you want to hear of something really ridiculous, I was in the building business for a while in my youth, and I sold a lot of houses, about $15,000 each, and they had been resold, and during 81, 82, there were people who actually paid more interest on their mortgages in one year than the original price of the house. So talk about inflation. There you had a case for it right there with the present system, not the other system. So they brought on two of these disastrous recessions, 81, 82, and again in 1991. And then uh, they put the country in debt because we would run deficits. It would be rolled over into debt, and it just kept compounding. And how much interest do you think we have paid on the debt during that period? 90 cents? Uh, when, a, when a friend told me, gave me a figure, I didn't believe her, so I got the parliamentary library, <clears throat> to which I still have access as a privy councillor, to do the research for me. And from fiscal year 74-75 to 2013-14, we, the people of Canada, paid $1.17 trillion in interest. $1.17 trillion. Mark and I were talking about how you, you can envisage a trillion. And that was the money that should have been used for health care and education and, and the arts and for looking after our, our Aboriginal brothers and sisters more properly and decently and for fixing the infrastructure that was falling apart. And all of that money went into interest instead of the places where it should have gone. So we have been underspending on the real problems for 45 years. And that's the reason we have a deficit in so many areas and so many things have been left undone. The U.S. equivalent would have been 12 to 13 times that the bulk of the U.S. federal debt. So it should be obvious what we have to do. Banks have to return to the cash reserve system, and a group of us, actually about 40, uh, came up with a very sensible, workable system two or three years ago, 
presented to the government of the day, which had no interest, and presented again to the government of the present time, which has so far shown no interest, uh, which um, would allow the Bank of Canada to create $150 billion a year and deposit it in the accounts of the federal government on the understanding that it would be split 50-50 between the federal government and the provinces and, uh, and territories on a per capita basis. And this would not be done for just one year, but seven years. Manitoba's share, based on the figures, was, would have been $2.724 billion a year for seven years, which would have helped a lot, I'm sure, to do some of the things that needed to be do, done. And uh, this would uh, go on for seven years, and the banks would have to return to the cash reserve system at a rate of about 5% a year for those seven years until they had a cash reserve of 34%. And people were always saying the myth that if the government creates money, it's inflationary. Well, if you let the banks spend it two or three times, it would be. But this was sterilized by increasing the bank's uh, cash reserves from zero, which there are today, most people don't know that. In 1991, the government of the day eliminated cash reserves altogether, so our banks have no cash except just enough to give you for weekend spending. And you're lucky if your bank has a cent or a cent and a half of real legal tender for every dollar you think you have in the bank. Um, it would bring them up to the level of 34%, which would eliminate inflation during that entire period. It would give the banks the kind of reserve which would mean they would no longer be subject to the ups and downs that they've been. And it would, uh, it would make the, stable, the system stable. And uh, most, of, most important of all, I think, no, I should say, after the end of the seven years, money created each year would be on the basis of 34% for the government. And we figured that that would be enough that uh, all governments, federal, provincial, and municipal, could balance their budgets with lower taxes than we have now. And, and uh, during the seven years, they would have enough surplus to reduce their their debt a little bit at the federal level, probably by about 30 or 33 percent. But it would be a system that would be permanent. Most important of all, the balance of power in the world would be permanently altered. The banks would no longer rule the world, and the people would be given back some responsibility for their own affairs. In other words, democracy would mean something rather than today when it's just being it's just a, a hollow word. It would provide the kind of money necessary to do other things that need to be done. Number one problem in the world today is global warming. Number two is the monetary. But number two, the monetary is the most urgent because if governments don't have any money, they're not going to be able to finance the fast turnover from fossil fuels to clean energy that is absolutely essential for the preservation of the planet. Absolutely. And I had two books on sale up there earlier, as you know, some of you, most of you saw. And then the first one, which was written about three years before the other one, 
Um, I said we had 10 years to do this. In the latest one, the Money Mafia, I said we have seven years. Seven years to replace the power source in every car, truck, tractor, plane, ship, and home in the world. Now you've got to have a lot of money to do that. But it would certainly create a lot of jobs too, like millions and millions of them. And people say, well, yeah, that couldn't be done. Don't you believe it? Again, a little experience helps. When World War II came along, we converted every car manufacturer and, and washing machine manufacturer and, and refrigerator manufacturer in the whole country, ultimately both in Canada and the United States, to the manufacture of munitions because we had a war to win. Now we've got an even more important war to win. And we could just reverse that process and take all these ruddy plants that are producing munitions to keep wars going in the Middle East, where they couldn't get along if we weren't providing them with the ammunition and the guns and the material to keep them going, and to spend that money on making zero-point energy boxes to install in all these things. And it's funny, I've watched the news, and they talk about windmills, and they talk about solar power, and they talk about thermal power, and they talk about every other power, but nobody talks about zero energy, which is the energy which is available in the whole universe for free. And all you have to do is get the box made, and it'll last you for a lifetime, and boy, would it ever be great in an ice storm, because you wouldn't have to worry about a tree coming down, taking your wires down, and having cold turkey for Christmas. And it's possible, but there is no political will, there is no appreciation, really, amongst the politicians of the world that we have a crisis on our hands, that we have a, a war for survival to win. Well, We've got to do something. And right now, my main concern, I guess, is CETA. And you should know the reason, I'm sure you know. This agreement with Europe is part of a series which have all that they are not trade agreements. They are labeled trade agreements to fool the public. They're investment and power agreements. And they're to give power from, take power away from the people and give it to foreign banks and corporations. And in a letter to the Prime Minister recently, I mentioned uh, that uh, Quebec had put a moratorium on fracking, for example, which some of us think shouldn't be a temporary moratorium, but a permanent one. And an American company sued for $250 million. And that's what they're allowed to do. If we ratify CETA, then all of this money that I was telling you about, which adds up, if your mathematics is good, to a little over a trillion dollars in seven years. In other words, getting back just about approximately as much as we paid out in interest to start catch up in all these areas. We couldn't do it because CETA would come into effect and foreign banks could sue us for tens or hundreds of millions of dollars for losses and potential losses of profits. So our goose would be cooked, and not just for a day, but forever. So, Naturally, I, I, maybe you have more up-to-date news than I have, but I'm just hoping that the uh, people of uh, Belgium who have voted against it and are holding out will continue to hold out and won't get uh, taken up by the power of the 
pressure that's being exerted on them, including by us. We sent a Mr. Pettigrew, a former cabinet minister, over there to lobby with them and to uh, to try and persuade them to go along and be good fellows and uh, let the the treaty be signed next week. Well, the bottom line in my latest book. Uh, is that the missing link in all of this is spirituality. <clears throat> Some U.S. money has written on it in God we trust. Well, that may have been true at one time, but not recently. It should be in power and technology we trust. Actually, in my two latest books, my second latest book, I have a chapter entitled Mammon Rules the World, and that is true, especially as long as we are captives of a corrupt financial system. But I try not to end a book on a totally down note. I give up the facts, and as you see, those of you who have bought the books, I always input, put in recommendations as to what has to be done, a whole list of them. I've never written a book yet that said the world's going to hell and I don't know what to do about it because I don't think that's fair. Everybody can see that things are in bad shape. What they want to know is what they have to do about it. So that's uh, the message we try to get through. <coughs> and, uh, and I point out that there are some wonderful things happening at the micro level. And I know a lot of people who have dedicated their lives to helping others starting orphanages and starting uh, new hospitals and starting all sorts of things to, to share and to help people who are less off, well off than themselves. And that is going on by the thousand around the world. And we don't have to have a majority, but we have to have a bigger minority. And so what I'm calling for is a tsunami of change. And it starts if, with every one of us as an individual. Because we can't run the world, but we can run our own lives. That's the thing that we do have control over. And think of the needs of others. And live the golden rule, because I can't think of a problem anywhere in the world that couldn't be solved if we actually lived the golden rule. And that's the one precept that every major religion has in common, the golden rule. There's only problem, one problem, that's none of us practice it. And if we did, a miracle would happen. Joy and justice would be intertwined in our journeys and in the world we create because we're writing our own history. Then and then only, would there be light at the end of the tunnel? Thank you very much. <laughs>
with the expenses and the costs, why that, uh, that would be helpful. Okay, questions? Uh, First of all, thank you, uh, Mr. Hellier, for taking your time and very valuable time at 93 years old to come out and to show enough interest in all of us and everyone in this country uh, a new way of thinking, which is not so new, but new to a lot of people that you're now discussing with. I want to ask a question regarding politics, and it always seems to be, and forgive me, I know you have been a politician most of your life, and I lost a lot of respect for politicians over my years, as many people have. And I, I always wondered why they've been self-centered and focused on getting re-elected. And then you hear something like this, which seems so natural and so easy. They would be held out like kings if they turned this thing around and created a society that actually was a fair society for both rich and poor. And I, I can't understand for the life of me why they don't. So what could you answer me from a politician's perspective? why they don't make this step? What, what would prohibit them from doing something what seems so simple? Well, um, it's a complex question. Most politicians that I've known have gone into politics with good motives. They've wanted to help. There have been some exceptions, but a lot of them have, uh, have gone in with good motives. Um, and a couple of things intervene. One, two or three governments in a row had promised jobs, 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 and none of them delivered. So I think I explained tonight why not. Because, in effect, the money mafia was running the show. And they didn't understand what we were talking about tonight. If they had understood it and acted on it, then they could have provided jobs because all they needed to do was to get the Bank of Canada to create enough money to start building better transportation systems and replacing lead pipes with uh, something that doesn't make people sick and uh, putting uh, proper water facilities and outposts that have boil alerts and, and, uh, and doing all of the things that have to be done to provide jobs, and not just provide jobs, but to give people useful employment towards building a better world. But they ran up against this, this barn door was created by people saying, oh, well, you can't do that. It would be inflationary. And you don't even consider, don't even talk about it. And so uh, they, they, it was, it's a terrible feeling. I'm going to give you an example from real life. Mike Wilson was the uh, opposition critic in 81, 82 when the recession was on and when they uh, raised interest rates and put so many people out of work and so on. And you know what he said? He said, this is insane. And you know what I say? I would say that Mike Wilson was right in 80, 81, or 81, 82. Ten years later, he was Minister of Finance. And I know what happened. The governor of the bank, had Deputy Minister of Finance got him in a room with 20 people and charts and graphs to show him that he didn't know what he was talking about to prove it. And so he was going out on the hustings and justifying the very policies that he rightly said were insane. Now, I don't attribute any ill will. I just attribute human nature lack of understanding, and in many cases, not being sure enough of your ground to just to say, well, I don't care what you say, Governor, I don't believe you. That's not the only solution. And I went through this with the armed forces. I know, I know how the system works and how difficult 
bordering on impossible it is to do anything of substance. But it can be done and has to be done. And uh, so I think we have to start with education. And right now, I hope that every one of you will write a letter, two letters as of today, one to the Prime Minister and one to your MP and say, do not ratify CETA and adopt the social contract between the government and people of Canada. That's what we want you to do and don't let us down. And it has to be a letter, it can't be an email because they don't pay any attention to emails. But if they get a bag full of letters, better still to get 10 bags full, then they start to pay attention a little bit. And it's gonna take a lot of pressure to get through to those people, and especially the Prime Minister. And, and you know, it would, be it would be criminal if that was ratified because it would be his legacy, which would be the biggest sellout of Canadians' rights and privileges in the history of the country. Now, if you were a Prime Minister, would you want that to be your leg legacy? I would say not, but we've got to get through to him that that would be the case. And that if he wants to have a great legacy, if he would start using the Bank of Canada the way it should be used, then he could be a hero of the nature of Lincoln. But that's the choice. And we somehow have to show him what the choice is and why he should go for the people. And you can bet your bottom dollar that the CEDIC agreement was not written by social workers for the benefit of the 99%. It was written by the top lawyers in Europe and Canada for the ben benefit of the 1%. And there was a, a leak, in the, not a leak, a thing in the paper the other day about a new uh, financial program to get Canada rolling. I can honestly say it was the worst plan for economic renewal that I have seen since I first put my foot in Parliament 67 years ago. They're going to, instead of creating money, they're going to borrow it from the very people I've been talking about here all night and put us further and further in debt. And it's still not going to get us out of the sinkhole that we're in. But it means that those people would still be able, and I didn't turn it around tonight as much as I should have. The opposite of ratio 20 to 1 is that they are able to buy up the world's assets for five cents in the dollar. Wouldn't you like to be able to go out and buy a car or, or a uh, skyscraper or a condo or something or other for five cents on the dollar? No, you get a, get a, a bank uh, charter and... Uh, Get it built up, well, you can do it. So, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic, but at the same time, I, I forget the guy's name that used to be in television. When he'd do something awful, he'd say, well, the devil made me do it. Well, it doesn't matter who makes you do it. You're in charge. You carry the can. You get the glory either way of doing a wrong thing or the right thing. And we want you to do the right thing before it's too late. Who's got the mic up here? Yes. <coughs> uh, so thank you for uh, coming here and uh, thank you for uh, provoking this discussion. Uh, I'm not a fan of uh, neoliberalism uh, for sure, but I... I don't um, think the machine's working. I can't hear. You can hear me now? Huh? You can hear me? That's better. Yeah. So um, I, I'm saying... Um, um, I used to read the, the Economist, right, and I don't know if you know them, this magazine. Uh, and uh, apparently, well, they were condemning Trump policies ag against. Uh, I have to apologize. I I, I can't understand. That. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, I'm I'm not a fan of uh, neoliberalism, but um, uh, on the other side, I see treaties um, that uh, free trade treaties that brought more wealth to the whole world, like um, um, the European Union, NAFTA, uh, even, um, well, uh, 
Philippines or Vietnam or China or whatever. So uh, if, if in one side, well, yes, they create uh, uh, discrepancy, you, you create um, a rich class, it's true, but on the other side, uh, you bring wealth to people who didn't used to have that. Uh, can, I, can anybody tell me what he's been, what he has said? Because I've well, I've I think been, I think what he's saying is that, that like the Economist magazine uh, has uh, 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 has been able to de to detail how prosperity has been brought to different countries as a result of these uh, free trade agreements that have already been struck up. So that might challenge some of the. Uh, uh, you know, in spite of the fact that there have been uh, certain beneficiaries at the higher end, that uh, there has been increased prosperity as a result of these free trade agreements. Right, right. And uh, uh, Donald Trump is also against uh, free trade, right? And is um, and Bernie Sanders is also against the free trade. And they are both uh, uh, well. They had success. They make Hillary Clinton. Withdraw from uh, from ag agreeing to to the um, to the same agreement that that uh, Canada has with the uh, European Union, basically, right? Because well, the uh, the people in the United States are not ready to requalify themselves. So this globalization worked bad for everybody in Western, even in Western Europe. But people were able to find other jobs. Right? Not in U.S., but not because of free trade. It's because of the poor education system, I would say. So I would w I'm wondering, uh, NAFTA works, European Union works, uh, the ASEAN uh, uh, treaty works. So what is the limit of free trade? Why not Canada uh, uh, together with European Union would work? I mean, so... Two, two countries together would work, like, or three countries together would work, but not 20 countries together? I just don't understand this point. Michael, can you he's, help me he's out basic, he, he seems to be asserting that uh, free trade agreements one-on-one, -on -one, um, there's been a, a, a record of, of prosperity resulting from this, and that, for example, even though there's a lot of, uh, uh, you have Trump supporters and Bernie Sanders supporters who are critical of these free trade agreements, Maybe the, the real reason for the, uh, uh, the, the hardship they're experiencing is, is not based in these trade agreements. So I, I guess he, he's basically trying to maybe giving, opening up an opportunity for you to express that record of free trade. Has it not been uh, beneficial for the 99%? The um, yeah, well, um, you say that the, the trade agreements have worked. The average Canadian is no better off now than we'd, when we signed the uh, accord with the United States, the original one. And uh, we, all of our major transnationals have gone. I used to do, I've done a little investing over there, and I used to have money in International Nickel and Alcan and, uh, and uh, uh, Stelco and, and uh, the big McMillan, Blodell, the big, uh, uh, forest industry uh, uh, organization of the, on the uh, West Coast, huge companies, all gone since uh, we signed the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement and NAFTA. And with them, the prized jobs of looking after their, their, the, uh, the uh, lawyers and the accountants and all of this sort of thing. When the companies left, then they had to go international and they become, the lawyers and so on become uh, branch plants of the uh, Americans. And, uh, and the, the middle class in Canada was actually decimated by imports. And it's, it's just obvious that we are not big enough to compete with China or the United States or the European Union because they have such a greater scale. We're not going to be able to compete with, with Germany. There's, there's no way that we can. But on the principle of free trade, one of my first <clears throat> uh, speeches in the House of Commons 60 years ago was in favor of free trade. But to bring it in at a rate of 2% a year, dropping tariffs 2% a year. 
so that the people at the bottom could come up at a rate, but the people who were already there, like the people in Canada who were working in manufacturing jobs, wouldn't be decimated and lose their jobs, which is, you know, it's painful. And I, I look around uh, recently, uh, the uh, Campbell Soup left Canada and, and uh, the pickle company that uh, left Canada and uh, the, the people who, who make the jam left Canada. And the first thing I noticed in the, my little town of Gravenhurst, when they, uh, after the trade agreement, the, the local paint factory left Canada and, and really decimated the town for a while. And it has not, despite the, the, uh, the propaganda, it has not benefited us as a, as a whole. There have been winners and losers. There always will be. And I, I'm fully cognizant of that. But the, th the real thing here is not the trade. There are two Canadian economists, and I wish I could uh, remember their names. Douglas Porter was one of them, who wrote an essay saying that there are many studies that show that trade is beneficial. But there's none that show that universal investment is beneficial. And behind this whole movement, for the last 30 years, has been the original robber barons of the United States who would build up their empires as far as they could go in their country to say, we have to have more territory. We have to have new ponds to fish in. So they say, we'll have to get um, other countries to let us into their, give them access into our things. And that's exactly what happened. And it's been going on, and the idea is a cartelization that the cartels in oil and, uh, and uh, pharmaceuticals and so on were so successful. This is, they said, we can do this in everything. And when they succeeded in doing it in agriculture, prices of food went up 200% in the world. And so you're a struggling person in Africa or Central America or somewhere, and all of a sudden, the money you have available for food will only go half as far as it went before. And what's happening? The people, including the, the, the cartel that I'm talking about, the, uh, the, uh, the people running the, the show, get higher returns and more wealth, and that's the reason that the 62, that the money's all flowing up to the top. This is not a trickle-down system. This is a trickle-up. And people, in our, most of our people, are getting further and further in debt. They're further in debt today than they've ever been before in their lives. And so where's the money going? The money's going to the people who have designed these agreements for their benefit, not for the total benefit. And so that's the reason, and I think, you know, if there were just a trade agreement, but if you read um, which one of my books anyway, when we signed the agreement with the United States, they had two bottom line things that they wanted be in order for, for an agreement. We had two, they got both of theirs, and we got neither one of ours. And, that's, and now there's no such thing as free trade with the United States. If you look at your papers these days, you'll find that the softwood lumber argument is coming up again and they're gonna put tariffs on softwood lumber. And the, uh, and the Quebec government has just hired a, a special uh, <coughs> person to help them lobby on softwood lumber. So we have, we've been playing Boy Scout and it, and it has cost us. But we can move into the forefront if we change the system and have the money to become number one manufacturer of zero point energy boxes, for example, and lead the world. And I guess the, the, the overall trend I've seen, we went from a, a commodity-based economy through the war, post-war, a diversified economy. And that was good because we were, we were making our own washing machines and our own uh, uh, refrigerators 
and more of our own cars. We had the trade pact with the U.S. car, which was very good and worked for us. And then all of a sudden, we signed these agreements, and that started to reverse, and we've become, again, a dependent on resources, especially oil. And so our, our whole future sort of depends on the, the same kind of base we had before the war. And I think it's, it's just going backwards. And uh, we want to go forwards, not backwards. Thanks. Up, up here. Mr. Hellier, thank you for being here. We, I'm sure all of us appreciate your presence. Uh, my question is in regards to the banking system, and more so, uh, based on your experience in Canadian politics, what is stopping citizens from creating our own banking system and monetary system as well? What is stopping them from, from creating their own banking system? This, our citizen banking system, our citizen money base. Are you talking about uh, regional banks and so on? Whatever like, works. Uh, Ellen Brown's pr proposing in the United States? Yes, whatever works. But what is stopping people from doing it, except for the usual infighting that people usually happen to fall into? Well, I don't know. I guess just taking the initiative and finding enough capital and being uh, prepared for the kind of competition that the big boys will uh, give them if they, uh, if they try to do that. There, there's no legal um, set, but there's, there's nothing legally binding that keeps people from doing this? There's no, there's, I don't think there's any legal impediment. It's just uh, the system and the amount of capital that you'd have to raise and then being, uh, having pockets deep enough that they couldn't uh, put you out of business by uh, offering services at prices that you couldn't meet. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for, for being here. Um, a couple questions, and they're very general, and, and I'll just throw a couple out. But when, you know, what do you get a sense of what motivates that top 1%? Are they just psychopaths? Um, and, you know, you don't answer that right now. Um, and the, the other thing is, who do we owe $1.17 trillion to? Um, is, and, and is that something that we couldn't just wipe out once we realize that we've been duped uh, just because we do get to make up our laws? Um, yeah, I, I think that's probably a good start. <laughs> um, what was the first question? Uh, are they just psychopaths? Like, why? why? Why just keep draining the blood and nourishment out of oh, yeah. the earth yeah, and I'm people? Sorry, they let, they're monopoly players. And they'll admit that. They have a, a business plan that involves accumulating the money and power of the world. And they just keep on doing it. Not because they need it, but because that's their game. Okay. So they are psychopaths. Well, We're just I, pawns. I We're guess just whatever you want to call because them. Because they have no sensitivity to how they're affecting they have, they have no, everything. They, they are totally amoral at best. And so they will do anything to implement their plan for which has been working very successfully for a long time, <clears throat> to dominate the world by means of, not of armed forces, but by means of uh, money and trade agreements so that they get all the power without having to send their, their troops in. And in effect, they become owners and masters without ever having to fire a shot. So it's just a game where we don't matter. Yeah. Okay. The, the one point the, the, one sub, the second one on, on the, the one point one trillion that's just that we have to we pay to who to the people who lend us the money private banks yeah yeah, yeah. in some ca in some cases they're insurance companies or in, or uh, trust funds or whatever yeah. but whoever pension funds but whoever lends us the money we have to pay the interest to okay and so Rocco Giletti I believe is the guy the lawyer that's taking on the government of Canada saying you should that's never correct, have yes. made this agreement what what what's your take on what's going to happen well I, th I don't know the um, a date has been set for the next round which is uh, December the 8th and do you think he has a chance of doing what you're suggesting which I don't is know. Taking he's a very back? clever lawyer and a very good constitutional lawyer so he, anything could happen but if CETA is ratified in the meantime it won't matter. It won't matter. Uh, hi, my name's Colin Hamlin. I uh, work at the University of Manitoba. Thanks for the talk. Uh, overall, uh, you know, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying. 
as an argument, I think there's a lot of inferences you're making, and I don't think I could totally jump on, but I, in, in general, I definitely uh, think a lot of us share your concern for how the monetary system is organized. Couple nitpicky things. I don't know how the UFO stuff fits in. I don't think you have to make that assertion. Whatever your beliefs may be, it doesn't really have anything to do with monetary reform. I would say more or less the same thing with your zero energy box. You know, I'm a, I'm a chemist. I, I, whether, whatever you think about that in terms of technology, once again, it doesn't really have anything to do with your monetary uh, argument. Bringing it to the, the crux of your argument, I would just say that, um, I mean, I agree with you. I, I think this is something that Canadians need to think about. We need to look at where our money comes from, and you've laid it out quite well, I think, the overall history uh, in Canada. Maybe just a question, I don't know, um, it seems like, at least in the U.S., a lot of the concern about the monetary system came from the end, the Fed, kind of Ron Paul. Uh, normally, you would think of them as being on the right of the political spectrum, but a lot of the other th things you've mentioned are very progressive, left-leaning things. Um, do you, could you have a comment on why it seems to be that the monetary issue is something that more people on the free market end tend to bring up as opposed to progressives? Thank you. Well, I don't, know, I don't know that they do. I don't think many people bring it up, which is the problem. They just take the present system for granted and say, if there, well, there's nothing we can do. We can raise taxes. I think I saw where one of the provinces was imposing uh, user fees on a lot of things uh, to raise more money, or we can borrow it, and that's what the federal government's planning to do to fix infrastructure, in effect, giving the resources to the people who can buy them for five cents on the dollar. But you, you raised another point there. I, I mentioned the first two major problems facing the world. The third one is the one you don't want me to talk about. But they're all related. And I hope you get a copy of, uh, of my book, uh, The Money Mafia, if you haven't. Well, I, uh, you can order it uh, through my website. It was paulheaderweb.com. And if you wait uh, a couple of weeks, the cost will go down because the, the website in the moment has a, an inflated cost for, uh, for postage, which was a mistake. But that, uh, or you can buy it from Amazon. They have a pretty... The only difference is I'll autograph your copy if you get it from me. Um, but they're all related. And the, the, some of the, and that is the number three problem in the world, I would say, at the moment. And most people don't know about it, don't want to know about it, don't want to talk about it, but it's there. And I have subject a lot, been subject to a lot of whatever you want to call it, because I've been telling the truth about it. And I tell the truth because I think it's important. I think people have a right to know what's going on. I think people in the United States have a right to know that trillions of dollars of their money has been spent on things that they don't even know about. And when the crash occurred in Roswell in 1947, the base commander, <coughs> what was then the Army Air Force base, put out a press release that they had recovered a saucer. And that was in the local press. Later that same day, his boss, Brigadier General uh, Raymond Ramsey, put out another press release saying, no, that was a, it was a, a balloon. It was a weather balloon. And the first report was, uh, was not correct. The first report was the truth. The second report was a lie. The lie has become the official stand of the United States that hasn't told the truth on anything of significance since July 4th, 1947. And that's wrong. How can you live with a government that's taking your money and spending it on things that they tell you don't even exist? And so that's the reason I went public. I said, you know, what if they started an intergalactic war? What if they start shooting down the visitors and get them upset enough that they start doing problems for us? And, and what I 
do in my book, I try to put the whole thing in a package so that you can look at it and see how things fit together. And don't think that the cabal don't have relationships with people from elsewhere, because they do. And they have some treaties, and they have some obligations. And they affect all of us. But it's number three. And we've got, uh, as far as the problems are concerned, so I'm concentrating on the two. And right now I'm concentrating on money and banking because it's most urgent. And if you want to <clears throat> clip their power, and you want to make sure that they don't do a lot of things that they sh shouldn't do, you've got to change the monetary system because the, monitor, the, the monetary cartel is just like a giant snake. And it coils around a country and gets tighter and tighter and tighter, and you get more and more debt and obligations until you can't move. And the only thing you can do to deal with a snake is cut, cut its head off. And that's what our proposal really does, because it gives power back to the people. And then after you do that, then you're on a more even slope when you start uh, dealing with some other problems that are inevitably to arise later on. I, I just had a quick comment. You had uh, mentioned um, that, uh, I, I guess, that the free markets are, are not working through the free trade agreements. Now, there's only one group out there that can take your money without asking you for it, and that's called the federal government and the provincial government and the municipal government. And they provide you a bunch of services that, you know, are generally dubious, of dubious value. Now, there's only, there's only one group, there, there's uh, industrialist enterprising people who provide you goods that you can go into a store and buy voluntarily. And you've t I think you've turned it around here, where you're kind of attacking the people who provide those goods that you can buy voluntarily, you can pay for them. And, and, uh, and it's actually the governments that are taking your money that are doing all the destruction, that are giving you uh, high-priced energy, you know, solar and wind, that are driving those companies out of Ontario now because they can't afford to operate under those conditions. So I think you have it backwards. I'm, uh, this, there's no single answer to your, to your question. <clears throat> Some government is very inefficient. And believe me, I'm the first to, uh, to admit that. I've seen some terrible mistakes. But I can also appreciate when I had a heart attack and uh, had to call 911, I appreciated that somebody came and a couple of stocky ladies and carried me down some icy steps and took me to General Hospital and looked after me and uh, and provided the care that I needed to uh, survive for 15 or 20 years and keep on creating as much trouble as I can. And uh, so there, there are things that government can and should do. And uh, we should appreciate that, that we do get a lot of uh, value for some of the taxes we pay. And we should try to hold governments accountable when they start wasting our money, which has been the case in uh, in uh, Ontario Hydro and other places, and uh, put, and keep their feet to the fire and say, uh, if you can't uh, if you can't run it <coughs> as a, a business, why then uh, we'll have to find some other solution. But um, my, as I say in my books, I am not for big government. I'm not for small government. I'm for good government. And that is what I think we can have more of if more people. Uh, were more, took more interest in what government is doing and uh, were willing to spend more time putting on pressure when governments start making mistakes, as ours are at the present time, both in CETA and in the proposed new recovery plan, which is, as I said, probably the worst, reco well, it is definitely the worst recovery plan I've seen since 1967, at least 49, my 67 years. And... Uh, so uh, I, I, I must admit, and it's, I think it's, it's truer in the United States now that they used to have people down there that really knew their stuff on government. And I used to admire them. But in the last 50 years, 
or 60 years, they have just moved away from being with it and informed, be largely because maybe of the, of the umbrella of deceit and the fact that billions of dollars have been spent for misinformation and disinformation. I have a friend here tonight who sent me a couple of articles that appeared in the uh, Winnipeg Free Press. NASA saying that they're, they're hoping that they'll, they'll find uh, something about extraterrestrials someday that they think there's probably somebody out there. <coughs> Why do you think they put that out? They know darn well what's going on. They have for years. But a deliberate ploy to get people to say, oh, well, it's not a problem now, and nothing's happening, and maybe, maybe it'll happen in 100 years or whatever. And it happens regularly. Like they think, they think there might be something on Mars that we should look at. Well, if you check your latest information from the some sources, you'll find out that they're already well established and know exactly what's going on in Mars. Um, I'm just saying we're getting close to 9 o'clock. I don't know how much longer you want to go if uh, maybe 3, 3, 4. Well, we've got four minutes to nine, Michael, so why don't you take as many questions as you can work in in four minutes? There's, okay. a, there's a man down here that's had his hand up, uh, hand up a lot of time, for a lot of time. Uh, yeah, but, uh, I was just going to, there's other questions to answer it on what I originally had, but just to point out to the gentleman over there, he failed to hear what you had said at the very beginning. Trade, you really don't have, it's not about trade, see that. But what it is, is about the laws that they can impose and make it impossible to have Canada implement any sovereign nation things. If we don't like GMO, we might be sued by Monsanto. If we want to get rid of the uses of oil, we could be sued by the oil. And all the gains we would have by making those changes are, would, would be impossibly costly. So I'm not sure you heard the sovereignty which you, and the other part. And my last question was going to be, and I can find this out later for you, more on this Comer report that the guy said. That. So, so sovereignty, and I don't want to overdo it. There are a lot of things we have to do collegially in the world. And I was going to say any fool can see that, including me. Uh, but there are things where we shouldn't have to do what somebody else says, and especially if they don't know us and don't know what we want or why we want it. And the problem with every one of those trade agreements is one problem. They give greater rights to foreign corporations and banks than Canadian citizens have in their own country. Now that's wrong. Absolutely and definitely wrong. Thank you, Paul, for uh, taking questions. Um, my question is regard to the uh, secret space program, and you've made a fair bit of uh, the which program? secret space program, and uh, there's been a lot of whistleblowers lately um, coming out, Catherine Austin Fitz being one of them, the Assistant Secretary of the Department of Housing, has mentioned trillions of dollars get funneled from all sorts of departments, um, and this has been going on for 40 years at least, and I was just wondering, what's your take on where the disclosure movement is going and would this solve the money issue? Would there be a reformation with the money system if the governments were to acknowledge the UFO presence? Well, I don't think the government's going to acknowledge it. They're in so deep now, they don't know how to get out. Um, there will be more whistleblowers, that's for sure, and especially as the people get older who are subject to oaths and couldn't say anything. They are starting to talk and, uh, and to make statements and so on, which those of us who follow these things know about because we follow them. But they're not going to get wide uh, coverage because um, some of you have probably read the book um, The True Story of the Bilderbergers by Daniel Estulin. 
And Daniel Estienen has just written another book <clears throat> in which he has a whole number of pages that set out every uh, conglomerate or whatever in the news business, both print and, and uh, electronic, in the whole, in the, the English-speaking world. And every single one of them is either owned or controlled by a Bilderberger. So you will not be picking up your local paper and uh, reading about uh, some UFO that flew over last night with a big uh, splash. Uh, because the, uh, I mean, there have been a few cases and there are exceptions, but by and large, this stuff is all controlled and the same is true with the money thing. And it goes right back, Ellen uh, Brown, Ellen Hodgson Brown, whose book, The Web of Debt, is well worth reading, at least the first hundred pages, <coughs> um, says that after the Fed was formed and approved 103 years ago, that Morgan Bank and a couple of other people got together and said, what are the, I think it was 25, most influential papers in the, in the United States? So they got somebody to give them a list of the most 25, of the 25 most influential, and they went out and bought uh, editorial control of every one of the 25. And so anything that criticizes the Fed or what they're doing and so on, it doesn't get in the papers. Pardon me? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Well, absolutely, and it did just listen very carefully to what she said. She said, I will disclose everything that does not affect national security. Now, you don't have to be in politics very long to know what that means. Because everything is national security. And, you know, they're putting, they're putting out a lot of files, but they're the incidental ones. They're the, the ones that used to cross my desk when I was minister. Sightings, you know, stuff that doesn't mean anything to anybody. But they're not going to tell the truth about what they've been doing all these years, <clears throat> how much technology they have been given, and whether they've applied it uh, in the uh, military arena only or whether it's been shared with... With us, some of it we've been getting. Like I have a little lead light here that I carry around with me, never go out without it. Well, it's just one of many things that we inherited from, uh, from visitors. And, uh, and there have been a lot of things, so that we've benefited in some ways. But uh, very little is said about that. And uh, very little is likely to be said, because if it isn't invented here, why, it's uh, not legitimate, you know? One final question. Hi, Paul. Hi. My name is Glenn Cochran, and I'm a First Nations man. And uh, I didn't know we were poor till we moved to the city. You didn't know what? I didn't know we were poor till we moved to the city. We didn't have this problem of the Joneses and keeping up with the Joneses and middle class and whatnot. But as I sit here listening to you, I see a message being given to us in a good way. So I think this message should be go given out there passed along in a good way through a good way. And the media it is not a good way. The media has not been our friend. Not to you, not to me, not to my people. There are other medias like the Facebook that you're on, and I'm on, that seems to be a good media to get messages yeah. out. And suddenly all th this group called Anonymous has been able to break through these media people that don't give us the information we need. So I think if you're here to create a movement, we need to bring it, like you say, instead of going from the top down to present this proposal, it could be repackaged and shared amongst the poorer people, us mm -hmm. common people, us grassroots people, to share amongst ourselves, and then we all, like you say, get a letter together and send it in. Those words of wisdom. 
You see, in your culture, you pay attention to the elders. And that's all I want to do is keep it simple. We have an opportunity to create an action plan here, not just debate whether you're right or wrong. If it's a good thing, a good message, let's send it out there in a good way. I'm sure the people will respond. Thank you very much. And I agree with you totally. It's a great way to end. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, uh, I know that uh, you know, a few other people who uh, had some questions, and I'm, so I, I'm sure Mr. Hellyer may have a chance to talk to you, uh, but I think we have to, we're already into overtime now, so I think we're going to have to close up. But uh, um, let's uh, hear it once again for Mr. Paul Hellyer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. You're, great. You're a great audience, and God bless you all. Thanks. It's nice to meet you.